The reason the collapsing buildings looked like a controlled demolition, say experts, is because they were a controlled demolition. Photos and video recordings confirm that explosions occurred at the base of the two towers as well as in Building 7 before they fell. On September 24th, firefighter Louis Caccioli told People Weekly point blank, we think there were bombs set in the building. That claim was echoed by many witnesses and by firefighters who heard the explosions just before Tower 1, Tower 2, and Building 7 collapsed. The steel-supported Twin Towers were built to withstand the impact of a passenger jetliner, yet the official explanation for their collapse is that the burning jet fuel heated the steel support beams and caused them to buckle. Expert independent investigators insist that it's impossible for jet fuel burning in oxygen to melt steel and that most of the jet fuel burned up outside the buildings in clearly visible fireballs. After the crashes, the white smoke turned black, indicating cooling temperatures not rising temperatures as reported. Why did a company called Control Demolition quickly haul away, melt down and dispose of 499,850 pieces of structural steel that could have proved the temperature the steel had reached and the use of explosives? Why did Tower 2 that was hit last fall first, 53 minutes after being struck, whereas Tower 1 fell one hour and 28 minutes after being struck. An even bigger mystery is why Building 7, owned by Larry Silverstein, collapsed much later on in the afternoon, even though it had never even been hit. If these three World Trade Center buildings were rigged with explosives, when could the explosives have been installed, and who controlled access to the buildings? The 30-year-old World Trade Center has always been publicly owned and managed by the New York, New Jersey Port Authority. That is, until a Jewish businessman named Louis Eisenberg became the chairman. Eisenberg is an active leader in Jewish Zionist organizations. He personally oversaw negotiations that put the publicly owned World Trade Center into private hands. Those private hands belong to two Jewish pro-Zionist billionaires named Larry Silverstein and Frank Lowy, even though their bid was lower than other bids. Lowy served as a commando in the Israeli army, and Silverstein just happens to be the former chairman of the United Jewish Israel Appeal. With Eisenberg's help, they landed the 99-year lease worth $8 billion for half price at $3.5 billion. During the moving renovations and security changeovers, explosives could have easily been installed in the buildings without detection. George W.'s brother, Marvin Bush, was not only the director of the World Trade Center's electronic security company, he was also the director of the World Trade Center's casualty insurance company called Houston Casualty. That company terminated their insurance coverage for the World Trade Center before 911, right in the nick of time. Another suspicious company occupied the 16th and 17th floors of the North Tower. That company, called Zim Israeli American Shipping, suddenly broke their lease, paid a $50,000 penalty, and moved out of the World Trade Center only weeks before 911. Zim Israeli American Shipping is owned by Zim Israel Navigation, which just happens to be owned by the government of Israel. If the new owners, Silverstein and Lowy, knew about the 911 attacks in advance, why did they buy a 99-year lease to the doomed buildings? Because they could do the simple math. Silverstein bought the $3.5 billion World Trade Center with only a $15 million down payment, which amounts to 0.01% of the total. He took out maximum terrorist insurance coverage only six weeks before the attacks. The demolition of the World Trade Center buildings on 9-1-1 eliminated Silverstein's cost for an $800 million facelift to update the aging 30-year-old buildings. As soon as the spanking new World Trade Center is finally built and expanded to over 11 million square feet of rental space, Silverstein stands to pocket billions of dollars per month. In the meantime, U.S. taxpayers are covering Silverstein's so-called losses. Then there's the big payouts from insurance policies, 
with mega terrorism insurance, which Silverstein took out just weeks before 911. Silverstein is demanding a 200% payout by claiming payouts for two separate 911 attacks instead of one. Silverstein's insurance companies called Swiss Ray and Munich Ray are the same companies under investigation for advanced knowledge of 911 and for profiting from 911 on the stock market. If Silverstein's insurance companies knew in advance about the attacks, why would they insure doom buildings? Were these giant insurance companies handpicked to keep a lid on their insurance investigation findings and to ignore the evidence of 911 cover-ups? Silverstein has since bought out Frank Lowy, paid off investors and loan groups, put limits on victim compensation claims, and turned the publicly owned World Trade Center into the smelliest private real estate deal in American history. George W. Bush threw up permanent roadblocks to stop an independent investigation of the 911 events. When the 911 Senate Committee report was published, 27 pages that would have connected international banks to 911 were censored. On October 30, 2003, a CBC television documentary investigated the 10-year friendship between the Bush family, the Bin Laden family of Saudi Arabia, and the Saudi royal family. That friendship includes illegal presidential campaign contributions and partnerships in oil and weapons companies like the Carlyle Group. Since 911, 2,500 relatives of victims filed trillion dollar lawsuits against seven international banks, against the Saudi friends of the Bush family, and against the U.S. government for suppression of information. On 911, all U.S. flights were cancelled and desperate relatives of 911 victims were grounded. 48 hours later, September 13th, an update. Private flights were still prohibited. To take off required government approval at the highest level. That morning, Prince Bandar of Saudi Arabia visited the White House. And later that day, something unusual began to happen. Despite the blanket aviation ban, several private planes, from Lear jets to a 747, were cleared to depart from various U.S. cities. On board were dozens of the Saudi elite, almost every one of Bin Laden or a Saudi royal. Meanwhile, Elizabeth Alderman was desperate to find a way from Paris to New York, where her son Peter was missing. The Bin Laden family, whoever was in the United States, got safe passage home. And I couldn't get home to be with my children. Other families couldn't get to New York, who lived far away, to even begin to look for their children. At this point, we didn't know who was alive or who was dead. I couldn't get home in the Bin Laden family all able to get home. Since 15 of the 19 hijackers were accused of being Muslims from Saudi Arabia, why wasn't the fury of George W. Bush directed at Saudi Arabia instead of opium-rich Afghanistan and oil-rich Iraq? Before the first plane ever even hit the first tower on 9-1-1, a massive military buildup was organized near Afghanistan called Operation Swift Sword and Operation Bright Star. 23,000 British troops were sent to the Oman Gulf near Afghanistan, and 17,000 U.S. troops joined NATO troops in nearby Egypt. All of these forces were positioned for attacks on the Muslim countries of Afghanistan and Iraq before 9-1-1. The Patriot Act, which was designed to limit American citizens' democratic rights and freedoms, was also designed and written months before the first plane ever even hit the first tower. So who exactly are the producers of the 911 reality disaster movie that collected billions from insider stock market trades, 200 billion and counting from terrorized US taxpayers, and gazillions of dollars from the conquest of Iraq's oil fields and Afghanistan's opium fields? Contrary to popular opinion, the producers of 911 are not practicing Jews. And contrary to popular opinion, the producers of 911 are not practicing Muslims. They are a secret network of international pirates who identify with no nation, no national flag, and no established religion. Their flag is the skull and crossbones, 
and their god, G-O-D, spells gold, oil, and drugs. It is important to understand the difference between the term Jews, Hebrews, and Zionists. The majority of the world's Jewish population are honest, caring, honorable people who practice Judaism, follow religious tradition, and embrace good moral values. The term Hebrew refers to the Hebrew language. It also refers to the Hebrew people who are the ethnic descendants of the original 12 tribes of Israel. The term Zionist refers to political extremists. Zionists believe that the Hebrews are God's chosen race of people and that the Hebrews have a right to the land of the Muslim Palestinians. Why? Because according to the Bible, God said so. These Zionist extremists represent only a small minority of Jews and Hebrews. Christians who support Israel's theft of Palestinian land are called Christian Zionist extremists. Their goal is to help fulfill the prophecies of the Bible story. Countless millions of Americans are reading a series of novels called Left Behind. They're topping bestseller lists all over the country, and they're being made into movies. They chronicle apocalyptic times. The setting is the 21st century, complete with warplanes and TV correspondence. This is Buck Williams reporting live from Israel. I am standing in the middle of an all-out attack. But the plot is ripped from the pages of the Bible, so it all winds up here in Israel, where according to the book of Revelations, the final battle in the history of the future will be fought on this ancient battleground in northern Israel called Armageddon. It will follow seven years of tribulation during which the earth will be shaken by such disasters that previous human history will seem like a day in the country.